With the upcoming Diamond and Pearl remakes being announced by Nintendo, the legendary home of Dialga and Palkia has received a lot of renewed attention lately. The Gemstone Duo was released over 15 years ago, with Platinum picking up the reins in 2009, so it's been a little while since folks have had a new opportunity to visit Sinnoh. To make sure that everyone's all up to date on the ins and outs of this wondrous region, we've compiled the top 10 Sinnoh facts that you didn't know, so you can flex your Pokemon knowledge on release. You'll get to know everything there is to know, from Twin Leaf Town to Snow Point City. Let's get to it. Oh. Alien number 10, Sinnoh was the original region. Like, not the first one to appear in Pokemon, because we all know that the first region we ever lay eyes on was Kanto, but canonically, Sinnoh was the first to be formed. Way back in the day, there was nothing. The world was a void, and it sucked. But then, an egg. Answering the myth of what came first, Arceus was hatched from this wondrous oval and began to create. We love Pokey Jesus. Arceus first created Dialga and Palkia and gave them control over time and space. Giratina was also in the mix, but we don't really talk about that. Then Arceus created the three Lake Guardians and granted them some special powers we'll go over in a bit. After the trio dove to the bottoms of three lakes, Arceus got around to making the region itself, with an enormous mountain dividing the land in two. Once the region was created, humans started living there as well. So every region in the Pokemon world stems from the creation of Sinnoh, the true Pokemon Pangaea. Kinda wild that it took them four games to get to their origin story, eh? Coming in at number 9, Japanese influence. I suppose if we're going to talk about origin stories in Sinnoh, we should probably discuss what it's based on. It makes sense that the first region is based on the country Pokemon originated from, right? You guessed it, Sinnoh is modeled after the geography of Japan. It's actually quite the interesting mix of geographical traits. Half of it is based on the Japanese island of Hokkaido, while the other half takes influence from some Russian islands. Major cities throughout Sinnoh are very similar to cities throughout Hokkaido. Jubilife City is based on Sapporo City, and Veilstone City's port-like qualities are drawn from Abashiri City. Mount Coronet is based on a mountain chain, and the root system even seems to take influence from Japan's own way of numbering roads. So if you ever want to visit Japan but just don't quite have the money for airfare, any game featuring Sinnoh might be a quality backup. Coming in at number 8, Tall Grass began as a myth. If you've played any mainline Pokemon game, you know the significance of Tall Grass. Stay away from it if you don't have a Pokemon of your very own, right? It's full of wild creatures and can be dangerous. If you walk through, you're bound to run into a pocket monster of some sort. But why is it that Pokemon like the tall grass so much? When did they decide that that's where they were always going to hang out? Well, if you delve into some of Sinnoh's mythology, you can find the explanation for that. It's said that when humans began to spread across the island, they started encountering plenty of Pokemon. For the longest time, the two species lived different lives, but would often help one another like a good neighbor and all that jazz. They would trade stuff like food and technology and support each other when they could. Eventually, one Pokemon proposed that they should always be ready to help humans, and that they should be ready to show up even before humans came by. So they agreed to inhabit the tall grass and appear before humans who enter the foliage. If you've ever been annoyed with too many wild Pokemon popping up, just know they're doing it because they want to help. Coming in at number 7, humans and Pokemon got along really well. This one might be a little weird, but hey, it's part of the mythology. In fact, some folks might actually be very interested in this information. Hmm. So in addition to supporting each other through exchange of goods and being ready to help, there was another way for humans and Pokemon to show each other how they felt. At some point in Sinnoh's history, people and Pokemon could get married. Lucario and Gardevoir fans rejoice. The relationship between people and Pokemon has always been a little odd, what with folks trapping creatures inside tiny capsules and making them fight other beings while also saying that they're best friends, but this information takes that strangeness to a whole new level. I mean, there are a lot of Pokemon that look like people, I guess. And according to Sinnoh Folk Story 3, people and Pokemon weren't always so different, and it was kind of considered normal back then. Although I can't really see this making a comeback anytime soon. Coming in at number 6, the lake spirits are very generous. At the bottom of the three famous Sinnoh lakes, there are three guardians of the water. Azelf, Uxi, and Mesprit. These legendary beings are said to have given humans the very things that make them human. Willpower, knowledge, and emotion were granted to the people of Sinnoh, and to this day, those are some of the defining features of human beings. Maybe these were traits that eventually caused people in Pokemon to grow so different over time. You have to wonder why they didn't grant Pokemon the same traits. The trio are Pokemon, after all. And a whole lot of thanks we give them, eh? By battling and capturing them after we pull them up from their deep resting places. Should probably show them a little more respect. 
Coming in at number five, we've got Tragicarp. Speaking of upsetting interactions around water, get this. In Pokemon Platinum, the good folks over at Game Freak added a new feature, the villa in the resort area. As a 10 year old with a bunch of deadly animals, you could own a house, decorate it with furniture and everything. But in that area, there is a legend of a secret ruler. You're encouraged to fish for said ruler and see what it has to say for itself. Maybe it doesn't want any visitors stinking up the place, but lo and behold, if you use a super rod and fish in the nearby pond, you'll pull up a level 100 Magikarp. There's nothing more tragic than this. Eternally unevolved and useless, unable to become a Gyarados, stuck in a tiny pond. Pour one out for that secret ruler. Number four, the not so elite four. Depending on when you first played Platinum, you might have a different view on the strongest trainers in Sinnoh. If Diamond and Pearl were your first trips to the island, it's likely that you struggled against the Fearsome Four and their champion. Eren, Bertha, Flint, and Lucian are quite the challenge indeed. And then there's Cynthia. Plenty of dreams dashed against the rocks here. So many dreams, in fact, that they had to go back and rebalance these wicked warriors for Platinum. Yep, trainers were having so much trouble against this group that Game Freak actually went back and made them a little easier to deal with. So for a big challenge, stick to the first two. I wonder how they'll handle that in the remake. Coming in at number three, the birth of Stealth Rock. If you're a fan of competitive Pokemon, this one might send a shiver down your spine. Whether that shiver is caused by fear or excitement depends on the kind of person you are. Sinnoh, on top of being the OG region, creating humans Pokemon, and being frequented by what is essentially God, also gave the world Stealth Rock. The move is a competitive mainstay and very polarizing, forcing folks to think twice before switching Pokemon in and out willy-nilly. That's gotta hurt, right? Popping out of your Pokeball and immediately smashing face first into some floating rocks? Absolutely annihilates flying types too, so be careful. Coming in at number two, there is a whole other world underneath. In addition to being absolutely jam-packed with tourist locations and sightseeing spots, Sinnoh has a sprawling network of underground tunnels to explore. If you're the proud owner of an explorer kit, you can hop down into the dark expanse and spelunk to your heart's content. While down there, you can mine gemstones and other items and even meet up with other trainers. It's also where folks could set up their secret bases this generation. This was a feature that took advantage of the Nintendo DS's wireless features, so it'll be interesting to see what they do with the underground in the remake. And finally at number one, Strange Exceptions. Sinnoh is a region that stands out among the crowd for quite a few odd little reasons. One such quirk is that it is the only region to this day to have six letters in its name instead of five. Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, Unova, Kalos, Alola, Galar, and even the Isle of A-R-M-O-R. -R. Count them up, they all have five letters, but not Sinnoh. Sinnoh just doesn't follow your rules. Sinnoh is also the only region to lack a notable dragon expert. No dragon gyms, no dragon elite four members, or other big time trainers. Huh. And to cap off our quirk conversation, Sinnoh also has a lot more shinies than in other regions. Well, in the anime anyway. Very unique, Sinnoh. And there you have it, all sorts of fun facts about Sinnoh. Hopefully I managed to show you some stuff that you didn't already know. So what'd you think of the list? What's your favorite lesser known fact? Did I miss any good ones? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more exciting ones from the Top 10 Scary Resident Evil Village Trailer Easter Eggs. Yes, my name is Jade says I am here, and we are glad you are. Mr. Cheese YT says, my name is Mr. Cheese, my wife. Also, I'd be careful, Connor is very protective of his cheese titles. And Elijah Torres says, ha, huh, not as scary as Sonic Forces. I mean, nothing is as scary as Sonic Forces, but at least we've set the bar with that one. And that is all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.